Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you to the presentation that we're giving today, which is the Traumatic Brain Injury and Stroke, A New Approach. I'm Dr. Randy Beck, and I would like to guide you through this presentation, and uh, hopefully we will answer some questions and bring you some new information that you're not aware of, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, help yourself or perhaps your family members or your friends. Uh, if they don't know about this, maybe you can guide them to this presentation. Now this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel and you can get the URLs for the YouTube channel from our website and from our Facebook, which I will give you later on in the presentation. And that will allow you to watch this video again or this presentation again anytime you want or at your own convenience, perhaps um, send, you know, sending uh, people that you may think would be interested in this uh, a chance to see it too. So I'm going to be with you in this presentation uh, in the right upper right hand corner uh, once we start the presentation and uh, you will see me there and I will be uh, sort of guiding you through the presentation. If you have any questions, please uh, send the questions to info at ifn.net.au and you will see that um, email address come up in the presentation later. So if you missed what I just said, you'll be able to write it down later and send some questions. Now we will go through the presentation and then I will answer some uh, frequently asked questions at the end. Questions that come up in a number of different uh, presentations that we have. So I hope I answer all of your questions. But again, if I haven't, please send us through an email and we'll answer those questions as soon as we can. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to get uh, started. So hi, here I am up here in the right corner, and we're going to be talking about f focusing for a few minutes on neuroplasticity and what it is. Now, neuroplasticity is probably one of the most exciting things in neuroscience that uh, we've been able to use to help people over the last 10 or 12 years or so, and uh, we're starting to realize how we can use neuroplasticity to help people that have had dysfunctions in their brain or dysfunctions in their nervous system for a variety of different reasons. Now, neuroplasticity is actually the innate ability of your brain to change based on its environment or the environment you find yourself in. And this has been very beneficial you know, uh, through, throughout the course of human evolution. But now we're starting to realize that we can harness this neuroplasticity in a way that we can help people. So it's a, your brain's response to stimulus. We can use that response that's to stimulus in uh, a variety of different ways to help people, which we're gonna talk about uh, over the next, uh, next slide or two. So as I was saying, the uh, neuroplasticity is basically the, the ability of your synapses. And the synapses are the areas in which your uh, neurons, which are the, the cells inside your brain that uh, cause us to uh, create electrical activity that results in us uh, being able to do things and be aware of things. These little synapses are areas where the nerves almost touch, but they don't quite touch. And this little space in between allows neurotransmitters to be able to move across them and bind to receptors on the other side. So the uh, important thing is that when these um, synapses become well used or when they have lots of activity or lots of stimulus, they become stronger or strengthened. They, they um, become a more uh, apt pathway for, that, for the brain to use. Now the opposite is true when there's not enough stimulus, these synapses can weaken. Now in our approach to neuroplastic, uh, to therapeutic neuroplasticity, we can use both the strengthening component and the weakening component to help people based on you know, where they find themselves or what uh, conditions they have inside their brain and how their brains are functioning in response to whatever um, situation they are in. So over the uh, course of the last uh, 10, 12 years, we've treated a large variety of different types of uh, symptoms in people and different types of conditions which uh, we have uh, outlined below 
in the slide. Uh, it's, uh, I'm just going to come back in here. Um, so we've looked, uh, had some pretty good uh, results with epilepsy, seizures, strokes, ADHD, autism, learning disabilities, developmental disorders of all types, dyspraxia is pretty much of all types, uh, anxiety, depression, spinal cord and brain injuries, concussions, uh, OCD, and the list goes on and on. But uh, the, the main thing is that uh, if you have a, a, some kind of condition or symptoms or uh, you don't even have a diagnosis, that's still okay. And, and you can contact us and we'll see if we can uh, help you um, in any way with uh, either finding you uh, the appropriate treatment if we can't uh, help you or you know finding a treatment plan that is going to work for you in our uh, unique approach of neuroplasticity. you enjoyed that uh, little video. Uh, now I want to talk about therapeutic neuroplasticity and what it is. Okay, so therapeutic neuroplasticity is the ability to take that natural or an in, in, innate neuroplasticity uh, that you have inside your brain and actually um, guide it or harness it to do what we want it to, to 
help you have a more normalized brain function or help the person we're working on have a more normalized brain function. Now I know that uh, a lot of you have probably been to other treatments or have undergone other treatments. We know that uh, most of our um, most of the patients that come to see us have been to at least six, sometimes seven other treatment modalities or treatment um, uh, regimes before they come to see us. Now, sometimes you've had results, sometimes you've had minimal results, sometimes you've not had results. And so you're probably saying to yourself, well, what's different about how you apply neuroplasticity than these other people that I've been to or these other treatments that we've been to. Now I want to just take you through a little bit about why we're different and why we might be able to help you when other people couldn't. Okay, so we are researched and evidence-based. Now when I say that, what I'm talking about is the treatments that we use. So the actual stimulus treatments that we use have all been uh, from evidence-based literature. We, they're all from clinical studies. And we know that where they go in the brain and how they help you and how they work. And so that's uh, the, the treatment component of our system is completely evidence-based. We've been doing this now for over 10 years. Uh, we've got probably the most experience clinically in the world treating uh, using uh, neuroplasticity techniques. It's 100% personalized for you. And we'll get into how, that, how we do that later. It's beautifully non-invasive, so we don't have to give you drugs, we don't have to um, do surgery or inject anything inside you, and, uh, but we can work in conjunction with drugs or with other treatments or other therapies that you may be uh, having at the same time. And so we're totally medication-free, as I mentioned before. So we have a few um, um, very good positive uh, um, attributes that we hope will um, be able to help you uh, in any way that we can. Now, often one of the questions that people ask is, well, how do you do this? How do you make this neuroplasticity stuff work? Well, we do it by uh, a, a very detailed knowledge of neurophysiology and neuroanatomy. And the pathways that we use are actually uh, neuroanatomical pathways that are present but may not be delivering the stimulus in the appropriate amount or the appropriate frequency or the appropriate um, uh, to appropriate functional systems that need to be stimulated. So we can use these peripheral systems and we can use these um, um, naturally occurring stimulus pathways inside you to aim our stimulus. Uh, into the areas that they need to go. Now, another example of this is this uh, next slide, which shows uh, how we would use sort of different areas of your hand and different stimulus uh, modalities on your hand. So for instance, temperature or um, uh, even motion, uh, sometimes even pain, but we don't use pain a lot because people don't like that, but uh, we can use pain if we wanted to. So it shows the pathways and where they go in your brain. And, and over the last sort of, at least, especially the last five or six years, we've gained a very, very uh, detailed understanding of where these pathways go in the brain. And not, not only where they go in the brain, but where they go after they've been processed and, and, and modulated inside the brain, which is even more important. So we get a very detailed understanding through uh, brain mapping technology that's available today. And the brain mapping technology that we use is, uh, is uh, first rate, cutting edge, uh, very, very powerful to guide us to where the issues are in your brain and where we need the stimulus to go and where we have to, and what types of, of, of stimulus and the amounts of stimulus that we need to change the way in which your brain is working. In order for us to get an accurate understanding of where things are going in your brain and how your brain is functioning, we need to find a way to measure that function. And we have uh, we use uh, EEG to measure the uh, function inside your brain. And EEG has been around for a long time. It's valid, reliable, it's non-invasive. Um, and it gives us an electrophysiological measurement of how well 
your brain is doing in a variety of areas across your brain. So we take the signals from your brain and we amplify those so that we can see with our eyes and, and, and have other technology like topographic maps that are shown in this picture here, the red and green and blue little heads. <clears throat> and then we can con continue to, uh, to analyze that data even deeper and drill down into it more and get with our low resolution electromagnetic tomography, which is the, um, the last two pictures on the page or the bottom two pictures on the page, with the, the last picture uh, on the page, or the bottom picture on the page showing us the 3D um, sort of uh, understanding of what's going on inside your brain. Now, bear in mind, when we're measuring or, or using an EEG, we're not putting anything into your brain. We're not stimulating your brain in any way. We're just measuring what's actually already happening there. So we're not going to change your brain by measuring uh, the, the function in that brain with an EEG. So now that you know a little bit more of how we uh, analyze and come up with the uh, functioning aspects of your brain at the IFN and how we measure brain function, I'd like to move into the traumatic brain injury and stroke component of the presentation. I'm going to go through a little bit of a uh, characterization and definition of what each of these things are. And then we'll move into some uh, case studies where we can show and demonstrate the effectiveness of the IFN approach to people who have uh, suffered from some of these ailments and conditions uh, in the past. So this slide is demonstrating uh, basically the uh, two types of strokes. Now, all strokes pretty much result in the same outcome, and that is, that is a, some type of damage to neurons downstream from where the, the blockage or the stroke has occurred. And depending upon the uh, uh, magnitude of that damage or the magnitude of the disruption of oxygen flow to the neurons, the symptoms may be uh, much worse or in some cases quite mild. So we'll start with the ischemic stroke on the left. Now the ischemic stroke is caused by some type of blockage in a blood vessel. Um, this is uh, usually a thrombus or some type of uh, clotting, uh, blood clotting um, you know, piece of uh, clot that has broken loose from some place. But it can be anything that blocks the, the artery. It can be an air bubble, it can be a uh, conglomeration of immune system uh, components. But regardless of what it is, downstream or anywhere uh, sort of after where the stroke has occurred, there's a reduction in blood flow. And the reduction in blood flow results in less oxygen getting to the neurons, which results in damage to the neurons. And depending upon the magnitude of the blockage and the size of the blockage, then the magnitude and the size of the brain uh, neurons involved and the injury involved will vary. So the symptoms produced will be dependent upon the size and the location of those neurons. Now the hemorrhagic stroke is slightly different because now it's a, uh, it's a break or an escape of blood from uh, the arteries. Usually the results of an aneurysm or possibly because of a torn artery. Um, the difference here is that there are, uh, is a, a different mechanism of injury that, that's also involved, and that's from the escape of blood from the artery can damage the brain tissue surrounding it. Now remember the uh, pressure in the blood is quite high, and the consistency of the brain is kind of like a, um, a porridge-like consistency. So when we have this high pressure blood escaping from the artery, it can injure the neurons um, close by. And of course, if the uh, break causes a reduction in blood flow downstream, then we have the same situation as with the ischemic stroke, where we don't have enough blood supply to supply the oxygen demands of the neurons that are, are downstream from the occurrence of this blockage. Now, moving on now to a concussion. 
the uh, concussion type injuries can happen through any kind of uh, uh, pressure changes or movement changes inside the brain. Now, the most common type of concussion that we know is from some type of direct hit. So you get hit on the head and, and then your brain moves back and forth inside uh, your skull. But it can also happen from things like blast shock waves. So if someone has a, um, is working in a mine or is in, in, a, in the military and they have a, uh, a bomb blast happen close to them, that can also cause a concussion because the sound waves can injure uh, the brain tissue also. So uh, we'll talk more about the uh, direct hit type of concussion now because that's the most common. So direct, there, there's two types of damage that happen and that is the direct damage to the brain as it slams back and forth against hard structures inside the skull. And then there is the torsion and disconnection injuries that happen to the neurons and those tiny synapses that are inside the brain. And I'm going to uh, show you uh, a bigger picture of the synapses in a second, but I also want to talk about um, another consideration when we're talking about concussion, and that's this coup, counter coup, or contra coup um, situation where, the, where if we receive a direct hit so for instance to the chin it causes our head to fling backwards but our brain moves in the opposite direction so it smashes forward and, and the front part of the brain hits the front part of our skull but then when our muscles reflexively jerk our head back forward our brain then sloshes backwards and hits the back end of our skull so we have now injuries at both the front and the back of our brain simply from, uh, an, from a direct impact at the front. Now, what we're finding is the direct impacts on a torsion, so uh, w which makes your head turn and go back, are much worse because now there's uh, injuries also to the sides of the brain. So we have injuries to the front, back, and sides of the brain. Uh, so torsional injuries are, are much worse than direct sort of head-on injuries. Now, I also want to bring up the uh, synaptic issue. So this is the uh, di this is a diagram of two neurons, and the neuron on the top is connecting to the neuron on the bottom at these tiny little synapses, and it's connecting through an axon, which is the um, blue little balloon type uh, drawings, which have the orange axon inside them. And this is important because the axons can be damaged as well as the synapses can be damaged. And usually in a concussion, this, di this, this damage or this, um, the, the structures become stressed to the point where they can't function well. And if enough of them get stressed, then you lose consciousness. So um, that's sort of one of the ways that we diagnose how bad the concussion is, whether you lost consciousness or not. Now, the important thing from this picture is to remember that the axons and the synapses both can be involved in a concussion type injury. Now, there also is another um, more sort of emergency type situation that may happen when you receive a head injury, and that is the uh, that a a uh, hematoma may develop or a blood clot may develop either on the outside of your epidural um, foldings or on the inside of your epidural um, structures and even inside the brain itself. Okay, so we call these, if they're outside of the uh, uh, epidural um, borders, between the epidurum and the skull, we call this a subdural hematoma, if, or sorry, we call it uh, epidural hematoma, if it is underneath the, uh, the dural tissues against the brain, so underneath the dura but against the brain, we call it a subdural hematoma. 
And if it is actually in the brain tissue itself, where we have this sort of leakage of blood or the forming of clots, um, we call it a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, these types of injuries are, are um, quite serious and quite emergent. In other words, we need to get you to um, an emergency physician, an emergency situation where they can monitor the uh, progression of these hematomas because they can build up uh, significant pressure on the brain. And sometimes that pressure will have to be relieved in a variety of different ways, some involving surgery. Okay, so uh, just pointing this out that uh, when we're talking about uh, head injuries, we need to also consider the um, medical emergency type head injuries that also may occur in these situations. Now, just moving to the actual symptoms that may develop from both the stroke and the concussion. Uh, as I was saying before, depending upon where the damage has occurred and uh, how widespread the damage is, we get a variety of different symptoms. So the symptoms that are possible in a concussion or in a head injury or a stroke are, are widely varied and numerous because as in real estate location 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 is the prime uh, decider of what the symptoms will be so if we will take for example a concussion that has caused damage in the frontal area of the brain and the uh, say the cerebellum so this person may have personality issues. They may have uh, inability to concentrate. They may not understand or be aware of things that are happening around them. They may have lack of behavior control. They also may have some balance issues. They may have more motor coordination problems. So you can see that depending on where the, the major involvement is in the concussive injuries, they'll get a variance of symptoms happening from that. It's the same as in a stroke. You can have a stroke in the parietal area of the brain and you know you may lose the ability to, uh, to understand the sensation of touch or even pain. You might not feel pain. You may feel pain when pain is not there. So you know that it's the um, understanding, the integration and the perception of things that will be different uh, in, in that area of the brain. So this little diagram just outlines the um, sort of major um, functions of different areas of the brain which may produce different symptoms. So there's really no um, purpose in me putting a slide up that has all the symptoms of a stroke or the symptoms of a concussion because they're so varied because of the areas of the brain that are involved. But remember, they're very complicated situations, especially in a uh, situation of a post-concussion syndrome that the brain isn't healing properly and you have a variety of different symptoms that seem to be unrelated. Okay, so just um, understand that uh, searching out where the worst injuries are and, and linking them to the symptoms that the person has is sometimes a complicated issue. Now let's talk about the incidence of these things. And uh, this is the incidence of concussion. And um, basically what we do know is that concussions happen when people, most of the time when people are doing things. Okay, so they're either playing sports or they're out doing some kind of physical activity. Often car accidents, uh, things like that could happen. But it's mostly running into something having something hit you in the head, or falling off something that causes a concussion. So when we look at uh, the <clears throat> rates of uh, athletic exposure, we know that uh, from a lot of different uh, data, so we piled a whole bunch of data together, um, roughly between 3.8 and 8.9 per 1,000 athletic exposures, we can expect uh, concussions. So that means uh, if you have a thousand kids playing uh, 
a contact sport on any given day, during that day we would expect 3.8, so four concussion, four of those kids to have concussions at some point. Now that can range up as high as nine uh, in the statistical variance, but you get the picture that there are going to be uh, concussions from from contact sports. It's just a matter of uh, how bad, <coughs> excuse me, how bad they are and uh, how many happen. Now we also have, uh, we know that concussions are uh, extremely prevalent in things like rugby. And in fact, 25% of all days lost in rugby are due to head injuries, um, mostly concussions. Um, now we also have the sort of um, recreational things that people do. So riding bikes and using rollerblades or skateboards and even ice skating now is starting to become uh, popular in Australia. So, and, and in warmer climates where they can uh, support an, an ice uh, making function. But most of the time, <coughs> excuse me, most of the time it's because people are not wearing helmets. So if you have children or family members, anyone that you care about that is doing these types of things, uh, biking, rollerblading, skateboarding, even ice skating without a helmet, please encourage them to put a helmet on because as you can see, 70% of recreational injuries are caused from biking accidents. So additional concerns now uh, with the uh, types of injuries that can happen with repetitive concussions, repetitive head injuries, are quite severe. And they involve the traumatic encephalopathy and the death due to second impact syndrome. Now the death due to second impact syndrome is rare, but it does actually happen. Um, and we've had several cases, one in Western Australia a couple of years ago. Now the uh, traumatic encephalopathy is what happens after repeated exposures, or repeated concuss concussions or head injuries before the other head injuries have healed. And it, it is a cumulative add, adding up or addition of damage that uh, builds to the point where suddenly there is a, um, an obvious decrease in the function of the person. So traumatic encephalopathy would be uh, probably best illustrated in the um, evolution of uh, the behavioral demise of uh, someone like Muhammad Ali, who was a boxer that had continually been punched in the head, and he eventually lost his ability to uh, speak well, and he became uh, almost Parkinson-like in how his uh, movements were occurring. So that's the traumatic encephalopathy um, sequelae. Now the diagnosis and management of concussion is also uh, <clears throat> very controversial, I suppose is the word, uh, because there are no tests. There's no blood tests, there's no radiology, there's no imaging studies that we could do to say, yes, this person has had a concussion. So the concussion is based on clinical assessment. And that means that the uh, impression of the clinician is what determines whether there's a concussion or not, especially in cases where the person involved does not remember whether they have lost consciousness or not. So if we know if you've lost consciousness because of the head injury, then you've experienced a concussion. We don't know how, how severe the concussion is, but it's more severe than one where you didn't lose consciousness. Now, that's a bit complicated because some people don't remember losing consciousness because they've had the part of their brain that is involved in memory involved in the actual injury. So a person may be found, for instance, uh, in the shower. They've fallen in the shower, they've woke up, 
And the first questions that we ask are, well, did, why did you fall? Did you lose consciousness? Did you, you know, hit your head? Did you, uh, and lots of times they won't remember. So uh, even on the sporting field, when we say to someone, oh, did you lose consciousness? They'll go, oh, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think so. But they don't actually remember. So the, this becomes a difficulty in the diagnostic criteria. So this is why uh, we use uh, a lot of uh, the psychometric testing uh, uh, available to determine uh, what level of concussion may have occurred. We use the EEG to determine what level of concussion. And we have some uh, software additions to that EEG analysis that have been developed to uh, give us an indication of how severe a concussion might have been. And we can also use that to uh, follow uh, recovery from the concussion as the um, concussive uh, implications start to get or better and better or less and less in the person. So next I want to show you this rather complicated slide, but what I want to talk to you about on this slide is not complicated. <clears throat> it's simply I want to demonstrate to you the connection of the brain, which is uh, uh, shown here in this gray square called CNS. That brain is connected to the rest of the body and the rest of the organs in the body through the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system or the hormonal system. So damage to the brain can also result in damage to your endocrine function or hormonal function, your gut and gastrointestinal function, some immune system issues, uh, even some energy balance issues can result in depression, sleep disorders, uh, immune disorders. So having a concussion is uh, not just about a brain injury, it's also about the impact that it has uh, on the rest of your body, including hormones and other uh, issues. Now. What I've been hinting at uh, throughout the whole presentation uh, is that uh, the symptoms that are produced from both a stroke and a traumatic brain injury are the result of the location in the brain that's involved and the severity of the involvement of those areas. So as I've been alluding to, the uh, location in the brain where the, either the stroke or the concussion has happened uh, will determine the types of symptoms you have and the severity of the damage will determine to a large extent the severity of the symptoms that you're having. So the main thing to understand is that the um, neurology and the functionality of damage to the brain is very complex and that's why we want to try and use all of the means we can including the EEGs and the um, psychometric testing, the neurological examinations, and the repeated appliance of these tests and measuring devices to uh, make sure that uh, when we're treating your brain, we're, it's moving in the right direction at the right speed in the right locations. So it's quite a complex process to um, get things working again the way they should be. So now we're going to talk about some IFN case studies. And um, these uh, case studies are uh, just uh, a collection of patients that um, we have seen uh, over the last couple of years. And um, hopefully you will see uh, someone or a situation close to yours that you can relate to during the uh, presentation. Now, the first case <coughs> that I want to talk about is the case of R.H. Now, R.H., uh, again, uh, was riding a bike. So this is he, he fits into this, his statistics that I've presented quite well. And he was wearing a bike without his helmet. Again, another um, big no-no when you're taking, play, taking part in recreational activities that do involve some kind of uh, motion. So he had a bike accident, and that resulted in concussion. And <clears throat> his mother said that uh, the last term of school, went, he went from acting like a normal 12-year-old boy to acting like an 80-year-old man. 
His fatigue was relentless. He suffered morning sickness, nausea, vomiting, and extreme pain in his legs, when he, which prevented him from walking. Now, I just want to point out that uh, he did not injure his legs in the accident, so his legs were fine. Uh, so something was happening in his brain that changed the way he perceived pain or perceived the way his legs were moving. And also, I want to point out that uh, he had also some hormonal involvement. So that last, uh, that big slide I showed you where we connected the brain function to the hormonal function, here is an actual example of that happening. Now, of course, the complete set of medical tests come back normal because there are no tests that can tell us whether someone had a concussion or not. So the parents were told that he was attention seeking and to push him harder. They did push him or tried to push him, but he fought back and pushed back and uh, things got quite difficult in the family. However, they moved on. There was some reduction in, in the symptoms, but he was still unable to attend school the next year. <clears throat> in 2012, he developed boils that made him very sick and he was, was prescribed antibiotics, which caused a dramatic recurrence of the symptoms from which he did not recover. Now, the antibiotics basically destroyed some bacteria in his gut flora, which uh, interfered or changed the way his immune system was functioning and resulted in a recurrence of the symptoms. So he was admitted to uh, a hospital for chronic fatigue syndrome, had some rehabilitation for that, but it didn't work very well. 2013, he was, uh, this is three years after the accident now, He's attending school for uh, around two hours a day, feels too ill to participate in any other uh, extracurriculars and even class activities sometimes. So in June of 2013, RH attended the Institute of Functional Neuroscience for an initial evaluation. So this is uh, him uh, on his first night doing his uh, first home exercises. So following, uh, so you saw the condition that he was in and following those exercises on the first night. These are the uh, topographic head maps and the Loretta images from him when he first started. Now you'll see the bright red areas uh, mostly over his left ear, but in, in some cases over both ears. And those are the areas of sensory processing and uh, what this, um, what we come to know that this uh, image uh, usually means is that there's, comp there's uh, confusion in the areas of sensory processing and he's confusing uh, information coming in from his legs as pain. And uh, we find that uh, when the brain is confused with this overactivity or hyperactivation that's happening, often it will default to pain because it doesn't understand the um, stimulus coming in uh, and it wants to make sure that you're not going to hurt yourself. So one of the best ways to do that is to produce pain and then you stop doing it. Now this next video is um, a video taken with him about six months after he had started care. And you'll see he's still a bit wobbly, and uh, in fact his little sister's going to push him over right there. 
Now this next uh, video is uh, after about uh, eight months of treatment and you'll see that uh, he's been totally transformed to a two-year-old child so neuroplasticity works. I'm joking, he's, there he is. So now we're uh, seeing he's almost like a normal child. We followed him up about last year and he was just acting like a normal child, a normal school, doing the same things that any other normal child would do. So these are the um, before and after maps that uh, we recorded from this patient that was just demonstrated in those videos. And you'll see that the bright red areas over his left ear and some small areas over the right ear uh, have resolved. Uh, so we have uh, the left picture, the left uh, area here is the uh, before treatment and the left area over here, and the right area here is the after treatment. And you'll see that these red areas have resolved significantly. And uh, what we find is that when we have uh, red areas like that in the brain, often those areas are the brain finds the information coming in confusing because it's uh, very much hyper uh, activation in those areas. And uh, we're finding the brain often defaults to pain in, when it has those um, scan results. <clears throat> we think because uh, it's not understanding what's happening. So it, in a way to try and protect you, is causing some pain to be perceived to stop you from doing something that may be injuring you in, in the long run. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, post-traumatic seizure disorders that can develop following head trauma. And by head trauma, also I mean stroke can cause these too. So uh, generally what happens is someone will have a stroke or a head injury and they'll resolve quite well from the initial insult. And then they'll uh, find themselves developing seizure-like symptoms maybe a year or so out. And these are traditionally quite resistant to medication. So um, we want to uh, offer these people uh, an alternative uh, approach if possible. And that's what IFN does. Now this particular patient um, experienced a stroke and you can see this area here is uh, the area where the stroke occurred. This is also the area producing the seizures in this patient. And it's here in a different view. What we did was, uh, you'll see here, it's mostly gone. So the white here is normal and the red is hyperactivation, um, usually associated with seizures or scar tissue. So what we did was we used a transcranial direct current uh, treatment on this patient and we just increased the opposite uh, identical area of the um, brain on the other side slightly and that caused inhibition of the seizure areas so uh, that worked out quite well for him and we see that uh, his seizure activity has uh, reduced dramatically when he first started with us right here on the purple arrow he was up around sort of 32 33 seizures a month and as he progressed through the treatment, his seizure frequency dropped until the point at the green arrow where we uh, reduced or stopped his lamictal uh, medication. That resulted in a quick spike of seizure activity, but then a quick reduction followed. And then uh, we stopped his Tegretol at that point, and he continued on the downward progress to zero seizures. Now, just followed him up. Uh, two or three years ago and he had gone three years without uh, cert without uh, seizures and he is uh, presently got his license back and so he's uh, his life is uh, pretty much returned to normal which is good for him uh, this is an AFL player and, and this is a demonstration of the massive uh, diffuse effects that a concussion can have. Now this particular player had more than one concussion in the same match or in the same game. So uh, he's quite lucky that he didn't have any sort of uh, 
something more major than this because you can see that the damage here, the red is the bad areas and the white are good areas in this image. So you'll see here that uh, he's had wide ranging diffuse uh, injuries which produced uh, uh, a multiple and diverse symptoms in this uh, person. Uh, we did do some measurements on those and found that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, we asked him how, what, how did he perceive his balance when he first started, and he was down around 30%. He's a professional athlete, uh, should have a balance close to 100, which is where he finished up sort of after four months of treatment. His headache frequency reduced dramatically over uh, the course of uh, the four months of treatment we measured here. His blood pressure was interesting because it was up around 160 over uh, 90. Now it should be 120 over 80, especially in a healthy young uh, athlete. And we suspect this was because the brain injury was involving his autonomic function, which caused his blood pressure to go up. And as we corrected his brain function, his blood pressure uh, moved back into the normal range, 120 over about 78. Now this is a, another interesting aspect of this uh, person's uh, presentation because we talked about how concussion can involve emotional components. And so we asked this person to rate his uh, general feeling of well-being and happiness when he first started seeing us which was around 18%. And then after the four months, he was back up around sort of 82, 83%, which is uh, a wonderful result for him. Now, this is the before and after uh, series of uh, images for this patient. And you'll see the before are uh, widespread diffuse damage. The after on the bottom are, um, for the most part, uh, normalizing. There is still a little bit of dysfunction here and here. And this is a perfect example of a, of a person who looked like they were ready to go back onto the uh, field and to start participating again uh, based on all the physical findings that we could see. His balance had improved, his headaches had gone away, he's feeling better. But when we uh, look at the Loretta, we see that there are still significant areas of dysfunction in his brain, which could have led to uh, catastrophic results if he had gone back out. So uh, he was advised not to go back out and play until his brain healed over the course of the next few months. That did happen, and uh, he resumed playing. This uh, next case we're going to talk about is this young lady, and uh, she was uh, 16 when she was involved in a car accident and uh, suffered some brain damage. And what we're going to do is show you the uh, first examination we did on her. And you can see um, the extent of the damage that she had uh, suffered <coughs> because of this car accident. Then we'll show you the findings of our scans. And then we'll show you um, the change in those findings as treatment progressed. And then we'll show you a video at the end of uh, her after the treatment. So this will be the video of her first examination. And uh, we've taken her through some, um, some normal sort of neurological examinations. Biggest one you got. I've just asked her to smile. OK, good. Look up to the ceiling. And down to the floor. OK, I want you to blow out your lips for me like this. Good. Now I want you to put your tongue into your cheek there for me. Push against me. Push hard. Now this side. This side again. Push hard. Okay, now open your eyes. Now I want you to close this eye. Keep the other eye open if you can. Okay, good. Close. Open this eye now. Good. Now, I want you to watch the red and white stripes go by. And which way do you want me? Higher? I'll go high. No, you're going to have to do it the other way. OK. 
Okay, now I want you to close that eye and open the other one. Watch the red stripes. Watch the red stripes. Okay, good. Now I want you to take your hand away. Smile again. Big one. Okay, now I want you to look up to the ceiling. I want you to look to this side. Just with your eyes. Keep your head straight. Look over here at my fingers. Okay, look over here at my fingers. Okay, keep taping. See the, can you see my finger here? Mm -hmm. Look towards it. See my finger here? Mm -hmm. Look towards it. Good girl, you're doing great. Look down. Look down. Look up. Look to the right. To the left. Excellent. Very good. Now you can go back down. We've got enough. Well, this is the um, initial head maps uh, from her uh, find, from her uh, EEG findings. And I'm just going to exit the screen and just talk you through this. So the uh, arrows here are pointing to a variety of areas in her brain that were involved in the injury that she sustained. These areas here are to do with her facial uh, muscle uh, inability to sort of move the face uh, muscles in the correct way. Um, this area here is the frontal eye fields, which are her eye movements that were being involved. So uh, we see um, w these areas here were the areas of facial movement, and these areas here are the frontal eye fields. Now, this was her Loretta, and you can see the wide spread areas of injury here. This is the frontal eye field area. This is the face movement area. And you can see over here, this is called uh, homunculus of um, movement. And uh, you can see that this area here corresponds to the areas of her face. Now, the frontal eye fields aren't on this homunculus, but this is uh, where they are inside uh, the brain. Now, this is her uh, findings after treatment. Now, this is after six weeks of treatment. And we see that those areas have pretty much, the areas of the facial movement anyway, have cleared up. A little bit of the frontal eye field still there. And uh, you'll see that when we ask her to uh, perform some functions for us in the next video, you'll see that her facial muscles work much better. Uh, she still struggles with her eyes a little bit, but uh, much better than she was uh, when she first came in. Look all the way up. And all the way down, just with your eyes, and then back to the middle, and look to the left, and now to the right. Okay, good. Now I want you to scrunch your forehead. Good. And look up. And smile. Good. And frown. <laughs> Brilliant. So I hope you uh, enjoyed the uh, case presentations that we've gone through, and hopefully uh, some of those uh, results have been um, encouraging for you. We're now going to enter the question and answer phase, and like I said previously, <clears throat> any questions that uh, you have, please send them through to info at ifn.net.au, and we will try to answer those questions as soon as possible. But um, we will answer uh, some very commonly asked questions in the next few slides. So let's get at it. So the, the first question we usually get is, how does it work? So how, what do you do that makes this happen? So it's a four-step framework that we do. We, we map your brain using the technology that we talked about before. We basically try to understand how your brain is responding to different stimuli that we put in. We put the stimulus in, we then measure again how your brain is going, and then we remap your brain to see 
what changes have happened because of the stimulus, then we go back to the step one and we basically put in uh, more stimulus and then we map it again, we put in more stimulus and we map it again. And so eventually we get a very good idea of how your brain is responding to our specific uh, treatment and other uh, treatments you may be on, including medication or any of the other therapies that we talked about. So what is the first appointment like? Well, we have a consultation, which involves a physical examination and a history of your life or your child's life up to that point with relevant uh, uh, happenings that have occurred to them, uh, like the baby when you had the uh, exposure to that uh, toxic situation or the toxic drug. We then do the physical examination, the neurological examination, we do a brain scan, and then we take any other further information that we have, uh, that you may have, CAT scans or MRIs or any kind of doctor reports or specialist reports. We take all that information and we then uh, compile or uh, compose, based on all that information, a treatment plan for you that we feel is going to be the most beneficial for you. Now, all this takes approximately 90 minutes, but in some cases it may take longer depending upon the difficulty of the case or the complexity of the situation, uh, whether the child is compliant with our examinations. Or, but for the most part, uh, between 90 minutes to two hours, we get most of the information we need. Uh, the clinicians are highly trained and uh, have a lot of experience dealing with the uh, uh, children that might not want to give them the information <laughs> that they're asking for, but we find a way to, uh, to retrieve that information. Now, uh, what stimuluses do you use is another question that we often get. We use a variety of stimulation techniques, and, and most of the, uh, like I said, most of the techniques of the traditional treatments that uh, I have outlined um, prior uh, we also overlap those with our uh, brain stimulus. So we use manual therapies. So this is where we use joint mobilization, joint position, um, deep tissue trigger points, um, deep uh, tissue massage. We use cerebellar stimulus. We use vestibular stimulus. So there's a, a lot of different uh, stimulus uh, pathways that fall into this manual therapy category. We also use visual and mental stimulus, and these visualizations or visual stimulus and the mental um, stimulus are usually overlapped with some other type of brain uh, stimulus like the manual therapy or the electrical stimulus that we might be using. So electrical stimulus is usually a very light uh, electrical current that uh, we can put through your hand or your arm or your foot. Uh, other types of modalities that we use electrical currents with include um, the transcranial direct current, which is a very, very small current that goes through, uh, very, very small current that goes through your brain, and it just helps us to um, uh, coax your brain to behave the way we want it to. Um, we use breathing technique, and a lot of uh, breathing technique theory uh, or therapy to try to increase oxygenation inside the brain. We use light therapy, so it's basically low level um, light therapy, which is the use of lasers um, that can go across your skull into your brain and stimulate certain areas of your brain. And we also use uh, music therapy, as I have alluded to before. So can you describe a, uh, a typical treatment plan? What, what do I have to do? What's, what's it composed of? Well, once we interpret and analyze the outcome of your initial evaluation, basically you're gonna be um, coming in for a, a treatment plan that involves 18 treatments. And these are usually 20 to 30 minutes in length, depending upon the complexity of the treatment. Uh, you also get some daily homework to do, so some daily home exercise, which is usually around 20 minutes. Now, it's not heavy-duty exercise that you'd expect. It's some very, very simple exercises that we would use. Um, 
we also will give you uh, some nutritional supplementation, which is um, appropriate for your situation. Um, usually, uh, you'll s the, the, the treatments, the 18 treatment package will take between three and six weeks, depending on the frequency of daily visits, obviously. And uh, if necessary, we have what's called an intensive program. If you're traveling from overseas or you have uh, logistical problems with time, we can often intensify the, the number of treatments per day so that, that 18 treatments can happen more quickly. Now, where are our clinics located? How, how do you find us? Where do you have to go? We have basically clinics, we're, we're expanding clinics across the world. Right now, we have clinics in Singapore, Perth. Uh, well, we have a clinic in St. Paul, we got uh, three clinics in Perth, we have a clinic in Sydney, a clinic in Hong Kong, a clinic in China, and a clinic in Canada. If you go to our website, ifn.net.au, all of these clinics are, uh, are there, and their uh, emails and contact details are listed there, and you can get in contact with them uh, through that means. Now, how much does it cost? is probably the biggest question that people will have. Unfortunately, it's one that I won't be answering tonight based on the fact that because we have different clinics, the pricing is different across those clinics. So uh, basically, uh, because the pricing is different, what I would advise you to do is to go to ifm.net.au, look up the clinic that you want to go to, and then contact them, ask them for pricing details, and then they will supply the correct some details to you at that time. Okay, so that draws to an end our presentation tonight. Uh, and if you do have more questions, just please send them to ifn.net.au and we will send those questions out to the appropriate clinic, the appropriate person, and we will get an answer back to you. I'm really, uh, would really like to thank you for attending our presentation tonight or today. And uh, Hope that this is fun, that you found something uh, new or something interesting or something that will help you moving forward in your journey towards the best you you can be. Okay, so I am Dr. Randy Beck, and I am uh, very very pleased to have had this chance to present to you. And I would like to sign off by saying thank you very much for attending and stay safe.